Dadhood. Modern Dadhood Podcast. <laughs> Bing bong. We're back again. I was starting to have my doubts as to whether we would ever return. Um, Me too. You know, sometimes, well, I think you may have said this in an Instagram post at some point. Um, I think, you know, life kind of gets in the way sometimes. Yeah. And that's all right. You know? That's all right. Just go on a, a little brief hiatus and then and then we're back again. And then we come back. There's There's never a shortage of things to discuss. Never a shortage of things on modern dadhood. An ongoing conversation about the joys, challenges, and general insanity of being a dad in this moment. Oh, that was smooth. <laughs> well, why don't you introduce yourself? Oh, my name is Mark Checkett, and I'm a, I'm a dad to twin boy, five-year-olds. And you, sir? And my name's Adam Flaherty. I'm a dad to two daughters who are nine and six. And I'm finally used to just saying it. I got a nine-year-old. A nine-year-old, man. Jeez, Louise. I remember clearly when I was nine. I remember clearly when I was six. Yeah, no, I can remember being... I, I can remember... I have memories from these ages. Um, and it is wild to think that now we're, like, staring into the eyes of our own children as they make memories. Well, I do want to say to folks listening, uh, if this is your first time hearing Modern Dadhood, welcome. Oh, this is a safe place for you. Welcome home. Uh, for those who have been listening for a long time, welcome back. Thanks for spending your time with us. And, you know, whether you're listening on Apple Podcasts or Amazon Music, Stitcher, Spotify, any of any of those platforms, wherever you listen, if you could please take a moment to do Mark and me uh, a personal favor and just give us a, a very short review and a rating, it would go a long way in terms of, you know, making the show accessible to a larger audience. And if you would be so kind as to maybe tell a friend about the show next time you talk to said friend. This episode's going to be an interesting one. Is it? So our guest is a personal friend of mine. His name's Tom Ajamian. Tom's got three kids, the oldest of whom is 13. So Ooh, wow. uh, four years older than my my older daughter. And... We're going to be talking about a topic that I feel like pops up on the show a lot, but we really haven't given it uh, the attention that it deserves, probably mostly because like, I don't know about you, but I'm super intimidated by it. Same, same. Uh, it's the the topic of uh, technology and internet usage and when to introduce that, you know, what precautions to take, how to have those conversations with your kids. And uh, I'm excited to get into it with Tom very soon. Before Tom gets here, which should be any any moment, I did want to ask about the the boys' uh, birthday has oh, had yes. been rescheduled. How the party was today? How did we, we go? Finally, we finally had the birthday party, and it was uh, a ton of fun. So many other friends showed up. They had a great time. We did candle pin bowling. We ate pizza. We had cake. We played pin the star on Captain America's shield. Oh, that's a Which cool was one. A, an idea that my wife came up with, and then she made Cap's shield in like a poster board and stuff. That's nice. We spent the night last night cutting out stars for all the kids and putting their names on them. But it was a real good time. It was it was a lot of fun, and uh, my boys were really good sports about having to cancel <laughs> the original party, even though it was a real drag, and we all hated each other for about two days <laughs> after that. I actually have some of the kids hand wrote cards. Mm. To, to the boys. And I just, I thought it would be fun to just read a couple of the notes that some of these, these five and six year olds decided to write in these I love cards. That. I love that. We what should, uh, I love it. And I think maybe we should take uh, photos of them and throw them up on social. So people, I would because love so much of this is like seeing the handwriting too. You got, you got, this one is legit handmade. It's just a piece of paper cut and folded in half and it's covered in beautiful red hearts yep. front and back. Uh, and the inside fully handwritten. Happy birthday, obviously. Yeah. Actually, it says happy bib, bib the day. Okay. She did the best she could. Uh, these presents are special for you. That's what she wrote. It sounds like something that <laughs> sounds like something, something you'd find in, in a fortune <laughs> it was like, cookie. Or something. Right. It was translated back to English yes, or something yeah, from a different exactly. Yeah. But sure. I was, I'm very impressed by this. This girl's handwriting it was very good. Um, this one's adorable. It's, uh, you know, she wrote her name and, and my son's name. And then she drew 
a, a wonderful smiley face and a, and a, a, a heart oh. in there, which I just, that's, that's cute. That's nice. Yeah. A lot of hearts. This one, I, I need to go back to the, the child's parents because I'm not hundred percent sure what it says, but there's a lot of, this would be maybe good for the picture piece of it, but so much effort went into this one. And I'm pretty sure it says something to the effect of, I like being with you when you sled. Okay. I mean, that's, that's fine. And then it, I think it says all class, I'm watching you. Mm. And then down here it says, I know you. <laughs> oh no. I'm sure it's not. I'm sure I'm adding some. <laughs> <laughs> and then, and then in very tiny print, it says, I live in your walls. <laughs> <laughs> it, says I'm, it says I'm right behind you. No, it's, it's really, it's, I know that it's a really sweet message but it's really hard to read and it's no oh, it's very funny it's very cute i and know this, you yeah <laughs> the implications there i know yeah. you i know you i know deeply. you <laughs> i know you uh and then finally probably probably my favorite one it's just a, a very simple card that says happy birthday uh on the inside it says you know this is part of the the card itself you already have the birthday the wishes this wishes you the happy right that was just like a sweet little okay, thing it's sure. like part of the card adorable but then handwritten for some reason uh, is just the words polar bear really big. <laughs> oh man. Kids say the darndest things. <laughs> Can't help but smile. Polar bear. Stuff like that. Polar bear. polar bear. Just like, as she's writing it, I, her parents are like, what do you want to say in the card? And she was like, duh. Pol- polar, polar bear. Obviously. Obvious. Mom. I watch you in class. Is that what it said? <laughs> I think. <laughs> Look, I don't know for a fact, but I'm pretty sure it says all class. I'm watching you. <laughs> That's even more ominous. <laughs> all class. I'm watching you. And then you. and then down here it says I know you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, kids. So I'm very pleased to introduce a personal friend. He's a co-worker of mine and a friend. His name's Tom Ajamian. Tom is a dad of three kids who span from four years old to 13 years old. His role at our mutual place of uh, employment is an associate creative director and a video producer. Tom lives in New Hampshire with his wife and the three kids that I just mentioned. Uh, Spent much of his time in New Jersey. Uh, Mark, you know New Jersey. Yeah, I'm I'm waiting I'm waiting to wedge myself in there. What okay, part, good. What, what part of Jersey is going to be my question when don't, at it when Adam go there done, yet? When but uh, Tom, I've been wanting to have you on the podcast for a long time. I'm glad that uh, we finally kind of made it happen a little bit spur of the moment today. Who uh, who canceled? <laughs> no, no, nobody canceled. <laughs> no, nobody canceled. We uh, no, it was it was Ryan Reynolds. Ryan Reynolds backed yeah. out last minute. Seems so. kind of like what he would do. I wouldn't put it past him. But I, but I, what I said, I said to Adam, I said, who's the the most Ryan Reynolds like person that you know personally? And I said, I don't get know on any, this show. Actually, my buddy Scott is a, looks looks a lot like <laughs> Ryan Reynolds. Scott, I would have said Scott too. I said I don't know anybody who looks like Ryan Reynolds aside from Scott. Scott's not available. He's in Puerto Rico right now. But I said if you want somebody who looks like Luke Wilson. <laughs> and Jason Schwartzman had a baby. It's Tom Ajamian. That was it. That, that was our conversation. Yeah. I can feel that role. <laughs> All right. Let's get this thing on track. Mark, wedge yourself in and ask so about Tom, Jersey. What part of Jersey? I lived in Jersey for a while. It's funny. I was going to ask you the same thing. But um, traditionally, when this conversation happens, it almost always happens in the same format in which I say South Jersey. And then you say, oh, uh, North Jersey. I'm close to the middle, which can sometimes spark an argument. That's the next thing that could happen. All right, let's get into the uh, the meat of it here. So, Tom, I'm hoping you can start by telling us a little bit about your family. Give us sort of a lay of the land, uh, you know, about the uh, the Ajamian crew. You know, then I kind of want to get into their relationships with technology. So my wife and I, we have three kids, 13 nine and four i a question, question mark, that yeah. you know that's time goes way too quickly and they just keep growing and it's a lot to kind of deal with but so we have a, a good range between each one of them 
the eldest is a girl, then we have a boy, and then we have another girl at the at the bottom there. So we have a, a mixture of ages, and maybe it's the case with you, but at least with us, all three of our children are dramatically different. Hmm. Uh, none of the pregnancies were the same. None of them are the same. There are similarities, but uh, all of them are uh, unique and <laughs> require different levels of effort from us. That's our reality. So my uh, older daughter is now at an age where she's starting to think about, talk about technology a lot. Uh, We have an old laptop of mine here that she loves. to. So she's very creative. She loves to type. um, She loves to write little screenplays and she gets on to Google Slides just through my Google account. And she just types and types and types. She has a friend who she's collaborating on the story with, but because it's tied to my Google account and her friend, also nine, is using her mom's Google account, they found a way to communicate by leaving comments for each other and tagging the other person, the other parent's email. And I have enough visibility into what they're doing to know that it's like there's nothing inappropriate happening, but also... Google Slides has this feature where you can use the Google image bar, right? And put in whatever you want for a picture and you can drop that into your slides. And I'm like that already, you know, already it is outside of my comfort zone because she can search for anything she wants and drop it into this slide deck or just search for whatever image she wants to turn it over to you. My question would be, so my daughter just turned nine and that's where she's at with this stuff and is interested in sort of taking things to the next level in terms of other ways of communicating with her peers. Sarah and I are not really ready for that in any way. At what age did your oldest daughter start expressing interest in that? And how did you and Jamie kind of ease into that process? So the first thing I'll say is that this book hasn't been written yet. We're living this right now. So we're I would say maybe on chapter two. Um, Hmm. And a lot of what's going on is done on the fly. And it's something that, you know, there's a lot of communication required to kind of end up in a place where you feel comfortable. But even then, you know, this is it that there is no, oh, we're good. There's always going to be something else. The three kids, really one of them, the youngest, I don't really have to worry about yet, which I'm thrilled about the middle child, my son, he, I'm starting backwards here because I'll get to the eldest in a moment. There was a point when, when my son, um, as part of the school, they get iPads or computers. And in this case, he's had both, but he had an iPad for school. And as part of it, they have this software that they use and they can send messages to their teachers, um, to submit homework. And at some point during the beginning of the pandemic, when they're all remote, Uh, The kids found out about that and he just started sending messages to his teachers saying hello, send greetings, that sort of thing. And we got a message home from the teacher saying that uh, he's not supposed to do that. And but it was one of those things that this was something that we didn't know about. Yeah, um, Mm -hmm. that he was doing it. We also didn't know that it was possible for him to do it. And it was a seven year old has connection to any teacher in that school and can write anything he wasn't doing anything bad. Most of the kids weren't doing anything bad, but clearly it was bothering them. So they told us and it's like, okay, this is, this is a new playground. We have to figure out how to, you know, we had to sit him down and have a conversation saying, this is a tool that you can use, but you shouldn't be using it in that way. So learning on the fly, because we didn't anticipate that with my eldest going back in history a little bit, my daughter, she was going into fifth grade. Um, and in South Jersey, fifth grade is still elementary school. In New Hampshire, where we moved, fifth grade is middle school. So not only was she moving to a completely different state and needed to find new friends, she was also moving to a different type of school. I mean, jumping from elementary to middle when you're prepared is a is a big leap. So we threw a lot at her. And part of what we wanted to do was knowing, you know, just the way middle schools are and high schools are and the unfortunate state of our country right now. We wanted to make sure that she had a way to contact us in case something, you know, there was an emergency in case she needed to, in case she was scared and whatever. So we had a conversation. We decided to get her a cell phone, Uh, not mercifully, but silver lining. um, Almost immediately, there was a global pandemic that basically (laughs) kept her home. Um, Mm -hmm. So we didn't 
activate her line because we didn't need to at that point. She was just using it for games and, mm. and web. So she had a phone when she was starting at 11, which my first phone I didn't have until I was 17. You know, I'm so old that cell phones weren't that common right. back then. Same, yeah. yeah. Um, uh, we probably, all three case, of us probably had the same Nokia uh, brick yeah. phone. I, I actually didn't. My first uh, phone... It was a, I think it was a Motorola. Did your, did your, uh, did your parents, any of your parents have the car phone with like the coily cable? <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> Love that. I thought it was the coolest thing ever. Oh yeah. So cool. And I, to this day, I don't understand how they worked. I mean, nope. I have no terrible idea. cell service here now Yeah, in it's 1992. A, it's a yeah. I have no idea how those things worked. So can, let's go back for a second. When <clears throat> you get this message from the, the teacher, the teacher's like, Hey, your son's kind of using this thing. It wasn't how we intended. Do you and your wife, do you have a conversation? And what is that conversation like? Like, did you know exactly what to talk with your son about and, and like what language do you, to use, you know, for, for this conversation? Or were you kind of both like, uh, how do we navigate this? And you sort of had to go off on your own and get on the same page first. Like, what was that like for the two of you? So my wife and I are very different in a lot of ways. Um, But this is one of those, one of those things that, you know, as soon as this comes up, we do have that conversation. We connect on that. And I'm sure I don't remember verbatim, but I'm sure basically the first, my first reaction was probably disappointment and frustration at the teachers for being Mm -hmm. angry at my, at my son. You know, he Mm -hmm. can't do anything wrong. He's an angel. (laughs) This is their fault. This is their problem. Um, (laughs) And to which then I'm sure she would have chimed in and pointed out that maybe that's not the case. <laughs> maybe let's dial down the emotion on that and let's think of the actual problem because she's much smarter than I am and, uh, and is usually right. And in this case, you know, she was as well. And she's, she's, there in the ro- she's there in the room with you now, isn't she? Actually, no. So right now I'm on uh, <laughs> day four of she's been in Jersey. I think it's just a universal truth. That's usually how it goes. I mean, that's how it yeah. is in my family. Yeah. My wife is way smarter and way more level headed and mm-hmm. all of that. I'm not going to say the same thing. <laughs> oh, interesting. All right. There's the dynamic right yeah. there. And you're going to edit that out, Adam. Mm-hmm. <laughs> sure am. But yeah, so we, we had the conversation to try to figure out, OK, we don't want to scare him. We don't want him to think that his his computer is a problem. We obviously want him to right. be able to do his work and we want to make sure he's in a place where there may be a time he actually needs to communicate with a teacher. So it can't be, you can't ever do that again. You know, this is a problem. Mm -hmm. It has to be more on the level of there's, you know, there's moderation, there's a balance. You should don't reach out to teachers that aren't yours. When you do make sure it's really important because they're busy people and they have a lot of things going on. And if it's not pressing and they're getting email from you every day, then it'll kind of weigh on them a little bit. And, you know, there's an understanding on his part. He just thought he was in trouble, but um, it never happened again. So we're like, okay, that worked, but it was just, it was a strange occurrence in that in what world would you anticipate getting the message that the random software your school is using for remote education also allows them to email anyone in the school and that they were doing it. It seems like an oversight, you know, it seems like a function, a feature that should be maybe turned off, you know, below a certain age, but I also have to assume like, he's not the only one who's like interested in in technology enough to like mess around with that stuff. And there were, the teacher said there were other students that were doing it too. I think they all basically discovered it and started using it. And it's like, okay, well, that's another reason why I was like, well, this is kind of on you as opposed to my kid. But I mean, yeah, um, to me, it just goes right back to Tom, what you had said a few minutes ago about us sort of figuring this out as we go. And then you add to it this pandemic thing, right, where all of a sudden we're all thrust into this new world of trying to figure out education. And, and it just adds all these other, I don't know, roadblocks or, 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 or elements that that people don't just fully understand. But like, I have to use it. And so they do. But they never really take the time to fully grasp the tool that they're using or fully understand yeah. the extent to which this thing is a part of their life now, Mm -hmm, you know, mm -hmm. that does lead me into, I didn't mention the technology of my eldest, which, um, as a 13 year old, the electronics technology communication, that game changes, you know, when you have a cell phone and when you're on the verge of going into high school, um, you know, there's 
far more, I shouldn't say greater. It's just, I think there's more of a potential for it of an impact emotionally, potentially physically Mm -hmm. that, that can come from these communications that, you know, the same way my dad didn't know who I was I on mm-hmm. AOL, um, we have very little window into. And the really interesting thing about it is that we do have technology and uh, we are as a family, we specifically use it. And even that is easily defeated in impressive and clever ways. And I can go into any and all of that. Yeah. But, yeah. Uh, I, I want to hear about that. I want to hear about that. But I, here's what I'm curious about. So my nine year old who, you know, what we're trying to explain to her is that every sort of next step you take with this stuff, you can't go backwards. And Sarah and I like haven't sat her down and had that conversation about this is what the Internet is. These are the good things. These are the really amazing, powerful things about the Internet. There's some really scary, dark, bad, dangerous things, too. And I feel like we need to educate ourselves more on how to approach those conversations. So like you were saying, Tom, we don't scare her away from using it or we don't make her want to use it behind our backs. But it's just such an intimidating thing to sort of broach. So my question for you, long, long way to get there. But when you got your daughter at 11 years old, that phone, what was the the conversation like when you said, here is your device that's connected to the internet you are free to use it um so it wasn't that okay um um, specifically we wanted to make sure it was pretty clear that there were limitations on it we had had because she's a kid and because there's lots of things like that that all the kids want instagram and pinterest are things that we need those apps and we had learned early on my wife's a designer my daughter likes to do things like that she's very creative an artist and she's great at it Um, So at some point there was, even before she had a phone, they had basically a shared Pinterest account or Mm -hmm. Pinterest board on my wife's phone. Mm -hmm. And, you know, she would just idly scroll through it like you do in a social media thing. Uh, It was completely controlled mainly by my wife. And I remember at some point I was sitting with her and she was scrolling through looking at, you know, Disney princesses and things like that. Everything you would expect someone who was maybe you know, nine or 10 to, to see. And then all of a sudden there was a picture of, uh, an elephant with its, uh, tusks ripped out. Ugh, um, what the hell? And I was like, what was that? And she just kind of, she went by it, um, to me, which was horrifying because mm-hmm. it made it seem like this is something that she had seen and just doesn't want to look at anymore. Mm. And I had no idea. Like, I don't, I don't understand enough. I didn't. And I probably still don't. Um, understand how Pinterest works, but at some point in what she was looking at, there must have been something with animals. So then maybe if you go down a certain algorithm, eventually it gets to the part where they show animal cruelty. And that was part of it. And and I was like, I had the conversation with my wife. I'm like, I don't like this. I don't, I don't want her to have the potential exposure to this. And unfortunately, the only way we could think to do it was by cutting it off altogether. Mm -hmm, So she, we didn't let her use that Pinterest anymore. So jumping ahead to when we had she had that phone and she could access um, the internet. Um, it was very metered and it's unfortunate, but you know, she doesn't have a Facebook account. She doesn't have an Instagram account. She doesn't have Pinterest on there. She has access to games, but she has to request permission to download them. Um, it's very controlled. And personally, I, I hate that that is the way that it has to be, but this is the, the training wheel stage really where you're just getting off the ground. You're trying to figure out how to make this bicycle work before eventually you take those things off and you've got to kind of fly on your own. You've got to make this bicycle work. I don't think bicycles fly. That was a weird metaphor. I apologize, but I've seen it. I've seen it. I've seen a bicycle fly. You're good. You guys ever watch ET for God's sake? (laughs) But yeah, so like, so the conversation we had with her was, you know, it is exactly that where we talk about how the internet, it has lots of things. It's very helpful. It's educational, but it also has things that aren't. And mm-hmm. there are things that we don't want you to see. And, you know, we're not stupid. We understand that, you know, she's going into high school. Um, in middle school, she probably sees and hears things that we don't want her to see and hear. Um, and it's, it's that amazing balance of, we know you're exposed to this stuff. We want to try to limit the exposure. And, hopefully our trying to limit doesn't make it seem like something she should be seeking out more. Right. 
you know, there's that dance you kind of have to do what, you know, where you're sort of saying, we don't want you to do this and you've got to do it in a way where it doesn't somehow accidentally make that thing seem that much more enticing because you're simply saying, we don't want you to do this. Mm -hmm. There's also this other thing. I'm trying to figure out a question as, as you're talking, you entering into this, this world, right. Where you're still, you're, you're, you're still responsible. of us are still responsible for, okay, if we're going to put this thing in our kids' hands, we've got to be responsible of doing it in a way where we're, as much as we can, sort of eliminating the harmful pieces of it, right? But at a certain point, there sort of also comes this this time, I suppose, where you want your kids to sort of have some like autonomy and sort of and sort of start to kind of build up the the skills to use the devices. I mean, they need the skill set, but they also need the sort of ability to like. Before you jumped on, Tom, we were kind of talking about this idea of you know, building up like your bullshit meter and learning about critical thinking and learning about like knowing when something it feels right and feels yep. okay to do versus something that just, this doesn't feel right, you know? And to us, I feel like it's kind of hard maybe to discern sometimes. And we're all pretty familiar with, with all the stuff that we're talking about. But what I was sort of thinking about when you were talking was like, is it, is it better to try to lock these things down when we give them to our kids, or is it better to just give them, but then police our kids, you know, cause both kind of feel a little bit like, I don't want to accidentally rob them of something. Yeah. You know, I also don't want to seem like the bad guy at any point. I, I definitely don't want to be looking over my kid's shoulder all the time. I can't feel yeah. good from their perspective. And so what you're talking about that's the book. That's the you know part of what's mm. being written here. It's this balance. It's privacy. Um, it's trust. It's boundaries. Because mm. if we lock everything down, if you can't use your phone, you know, if there's so many rules on it, um, first off, there's going to be resentment. Um, but then, to your point, you know, this is something that if we helicopter like that, you know, if we're mm. so involved, what are you taking away? What experience are they not getting and learning? You know, are they learning? Are they growing? Or are they basically being stagnant? This is something that my wife and I are talking about. So um, with my eldest, who's, you know, 13, she's a teenager. She's going into high school in a few months. Um, knowing what high school was like, and it's just the general hellscape that you then add in social media and oh cell phones. Um, everyone has technically on them a camera that they can film and take pictures. Like it's horrifying to think about. So as part of that, we have, you know, to some degree utilized this big brother method. Apple phones have screen time software built right in. Mm -hmm. So you can choose which apps to use. Um, you can choose times that they can use apps. A really good example of this is, we can say, you know, you can't use this app after nine o'clock or mm -hmm. you can, you have 15 minutes on this app each day. Well, kids are kids and they're, they have time. If they can't use it, they're going to find a way to do it. Um, we found out that you can just delete an app and then re-download it and your 15 minute clock resets. We found that out well after the fact. My daughter watched, I think, an entire season of Stranger Things in a weekend, uh, despite the fact that she has an hour a day of, of Netflix time. So oh she, and, whoa. So she's watching an episode, deleting the app, redownloading the app, watching another episode. The math, the math doesn't, doesn't I don't, add I don't up. watch that show, but aren't the episodes like 45 yeah, they're, minutes they're, long? They're basically, they're, they're basically an hour. Yeah. That's so kids wild. find a way it's Jeff Goldblum and Jurassic mm -hmm. Park. They'll, they'll find a way. Um, another thing that we found out and we learned the hard way, she defeated our screen time for, I think, six months once because she knew our password. She guessed it. Oh, man. Damn. So it's the <laughs> simplest go. thing in that if you can figure out what the code is. Yeah. At the end of the day, when she gets to an app and it says, sorry, you can't watch this anymore. It says request additional time mm -hmm. um, or enter passcode. And she would just enter the passcode and just burn through stuff. Oh, my um, God. Damn. And to her credit, 
uh, when we confronted her about this, she wasn't apologetic. She was like, I gave it a shot. <laughs> of and course like, she did. Yeah. yeah. And it's like, I, I can't be angry at you for that. I mean, I'm, <laughs> yeah. I'm disappointed that you didn't tell us, but why would she tell us? Why, right. why would she be like, Oh, by the way, right. Um, I know the password. No kid's going to do that. Yeah. So there, there are less clever ways to get around it, but there are other ways and there are people apparently one of the really common ones that we haven't had happen at some point kids figured out that you can do screen capture. And then if they hand you your phone, their phone to enter the passcode in, uh, the screen will capture what the passcode is and oh. then they can just enter it in themselves. But like there are ways that kids, you know, really simple ways that they can get into it and defeat these systems that are specifically meant to help them. And the other one that, that I wanted to talk about was we have this app called bark, um, which mm. is, it's a paid service that essentially does similar things. And it limits how much time you can be on apps, which seems to be pretty common for most of these things. But it also goes above and beyond that, and it reads things. So you can program it to look for words. Um, they have a preset dictionary, I guess, but you can change it. But in any case, it goes through every email that's sent. It goes through the notes app. It goes through text message. It goes through anything. Hmm. Um, and then at the end of the day, it directs you to this web page where you can read all of it. I don't support wow. that. Uh, I understand the value and the need, uh, particularly with some of the things people are talking about. But to me, that's the bridge too far. I, I, I don't feel like the invasion of privacy is worth the benefit of safety, even though I'm sure there are occasions where the opposite is true, where it is worth doing that. Uh -huh. So I would get these notifications and says, hey, do you want to check this? And I'd be like, I'm not going to just because that's too much for me. I I. I don't feel like that's too far away from me being like, hey, give me your phone. I want to read all your texts right now. Mm -hmm. Right. 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 I mean, in and, some ways, I mean, it, it it definitely brings into question like, you know, ethics and privacy, like you suggested. But it is also your family, your child, and it's your responsibility as their parent to keep them safe and protected. Yeah. I mean, it, what a big, giant gray area. Seriously. Yep. And, and we've had the conversation. So obviously we told her about it and she doesn't support the app. But when we found out that she watched the entire TV show in a weekend, I was like, we're going to have to cut down your time on that. And this isn't something that we want to do. This, this is a punishment because you betrayed that trust. But, you know, I, it got to a point where I, I was just so uncomfortable reading this information that I'm not supposed to read, even though I know that it's for her own good. Mm hmm. I was like, I'm just not doing it. So I just stopped doing it. It just seemed wrong. Right. Like in the case yeah. of bullying, you want to hope that you have raised your kids to, you know, to with enough trust and communication, open communication, that if she was being bullied by somebody, that she would talk to you guys about it rather Absolutely. than having to find out that she is being bullied and worry and worry, you know, it, it, is she going to become depressed or, you know, do, do something extreme as a result of it? Yeah. And it's just every day is another page of this book. It's how do we let them grow and learn and experience without holding them back physically? You know, it's learning all of this stuff. Cause again, we didn't have to do this as kids. No right. one was saying, Hey, who's in that chat room? Nobody was doing that. Nobody could right. see where I was. And, you know, I technically can see where they are. And it's just a question of how much power do you really need and the impact of it? Because there is an impact, a very real impact. It seems to me like the biggest takeaway, or at least the thing that I'm taking away here is kind of what Adam was just talking about a second ago, about raising kids to have, to feel comfortable coming to you, your, you, or you or your spouse, you know, with problems when they have them, seek, seeking counsel when they feel like they, they need it when they're confused or when something, again, when something doesn't feel right to feel confident in coming to us, even though we're parents and we're totally lame, you know, coming to us to help them navigate the world 
knowing that, hey, my parents are on my side. The, yeah, the, poli- the policing thing feels impossible to me. The locking it down feels impossible to me. All that stuff. But raising kids to that you have a good open line of communication with seems like the easier thing to do in a sense. But at the same time, you know, while I will state for the record that I am not a lame parent, um, I am though, because I mean, I am lame Oh, (laughs) because I am a parent. Like my, the important thing to note is that there are going to be times where my daughter or my son, where my kids can talk to me, but there's gonna be a lot of times where they can't. And it's not because they can't, it's because they won't. Mark, you kind of put it best with your question, because that's what it is. It's how do you do this in a way that it's not completely stifling, that they can mm-hmm. grow and learn, that they can live their lives, that they don't have to use it as ammunition against us as a reason to hate us, um, that they can also be safe. All of these questions are what all parents are dealing with when they have you know, connected devices or cell phones or laptops or iPads yeah. in their home. And their kids have access to them, um, especially when they're school age and middle school, high school, with all of the pressures and nonsense that they have to deal with already. You have that layer on top. It's just a unwritten book for everybody. And it's it's daunting. And it's like, yeah, this is one of those things that we thought about for years. And it's like, this is part of growing up. This is part of being Man. a parent, which is the, the various things that you just learn to live with, um, that you learn to let go. Now I'm in a stage where my daughter has a phone and is about to go to high school and it's all happening. And let's hope it goes smoothly. We haven't done confessions in a long time, but I was thinking we could just kind of roll right into confessions. We can invite you, Tom, to participate in this. I'm ready. I'm ready if you are. I will throw away a perfectly good toy at least once every two weeks. And I won't tell anybody, not even my wife. Confessions. 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 Board games are supposed to be a good, wholesome family activity. But most of the time when I'm playing a board game with my kids, I'm secretly seething inside, desperate to be doing something else. Anything else. Confessions. Sometimes when we buy gifts for the kids, we're really buying gifts for me. Confessions. 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 Probably two to three times a week. I have to stop myself from finishing a sentence with you asshole when I'm talking to one of my kids. When my six-year-old is reading a bedtime book, she sounds out each individual word and then seeks confirmation that the word is correct. I'm so proud of her progress with reading, but that can be so utterly painful. Anytime my kids ask me to read a Dr. Seuss book, I lose my shit. And I'm not entirely convinced I've ever actually finished a full one. Because at some point, I lose it. Confessions. Confessions. Tom and Jamian. Glad we finally had you on the podcast. Thanks for making the time to chat with us. Thanks for having me. It's been a pleasure. Dads and moms, uh, thank you so much for, again, spending your time with us on Modern Dadhood. Uh, Please, wherever you're listening, please consider giving us a a rating and review. That could be on Apple Podcasts, Amazon Music, Stitcher, Spotify, you know, a Jamian Casts, Pocket, Poo, H pod H H T A casts. <laughs> it's not creative at all. You know, wherever you listen. 
Uh, we have a website, moderndadhood.com, where all episodes can be found. We have social media platforms, uh, Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn, uh, YouTube, TikTok. Just search Modern Dadhood on all of them. You can also, if, hey, if email is your thing, you can also reach out to us at hey, H-E-Y at moderndadhood.com. You can say hi. You can tell us to shove it. You can you can suggest a topic. On our website, we forgot to say there's a shop button where you can buy t-shirts and dad hoodies. Yeah. Uh, every order ships with a free sticker. Thanks as always <laughs> to Casper Baby Pants and Spencer Albee for the music in our podcast. Thanks to Pete Morse at Red Vault Audio for making us sound great like he always does. Learn about Pete at redvaultaudio.com. Thanks to my friend, H. Thomas Tom Ajamian. And finally, thank you for listening. 